Our scripture this morning comes from the text that Reverend Forbes heard us read out of 1 Samuel chapter 19. We want to highlight the 17th verse for a thesis verse this morning. And before I preach, can we just honor the fact, isn't it good to see Reverend Forbes in person? Amen. Amen. Zoom is good, but Zoom just won't do. Sometimes we have to see you in the flesh. It is good to see her in person. She told me before the worship service started, I was ready for a preacher to give a preacher a word. She's a preacher. I'm a preacher. I thought she would give me a word before I came in here today to worship. And she told me, now I got a flight this afternoon and I need to eat lunch before the flight. Don't have me in here all day. That's the word I got this morning, y'all. So we need to come on and not tarry because we need to get Reverend Forbes to her lunch. Amen. 17th verse from 1 Samuel chapter 19. The word of God reads this way. Saul said to Michal, why have you deceived me like this? And let my enemy go so that he has escaped. Why have you deceived me like this and let my enemy go? Providence Missionary Baptist Church, with the help of your prayers and under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to preach to you this morning on the subject of the right sacrifice of love. The right sacrifice of love. Providence, most of you know that I have been in some way connected to the field of engineering particularly the specialization of industrial and systems engineering for nearly a quarter of a century. And factually, if not stereotypically, most of my friends and colleagues in engineering are from India. Though we are culturally different, my friends from colleagues from India, we are fascinated by each other's cultures. And we are deeply connected by our joint love of mathematics. One of the cultural phenomena that I was always fascinated with was this idea of arranged marriage. Whereas you and I meet someone, court someone, and based upon a deep and abiding love for that person, we propose marriage. I have many friends and colleagues whose families have maintained a culturally significant tradition, a centuries-old custom to allow themselves to be arranged in marriage. And I know my friends well, and it's not because they have no swag and couldn't meet somebody on their own. It's not because they couldn't figure out how to work Bumble or the other social media sites to meet somebody. It's not because they didn't go to school or go to the supermarket or go to parties and couldn't meet somebody to get into a relationship with. But rather, a friend of mine who's been happily married for nearly 20 years in an arranged marriage told me in preparation for this sermon, I did it because it's deep and a consistent expectation in my family that no one strays from. It gives my parents who arrange the marriage control over their family members. It enhances the chance that in my familial tradition, we will preserve our ancestral lineage. And it enables the elders of our family to maintain their social satisfaction with the idea of endogamy. You and I are familiar with monogamy marrying just one person at a time. Endogamy is the idea that you will marry and limit who you marry within a particular clan, within a community or a tribe. Interestingly, most of you in here decided that you were only going to marry a Christian, and so though you are practicing monogamy when you got married, you also practiced endogamy. Restricting yourself to marrying only a Christian is restricting yourself to a group of people within a particular clan. 
And whereas just over 50% of free will marriages end in divorce, isn't it interesting that the divorce rate for arranged marriages is less than 4%? Scholarly writing on enranged marriages teaches us that the prevailing debate is the sacrifice of love, as we understand it in the West, versus the acceptance of and submission to the wisdom of the elders in the community or in the family. With a divorce rate of less than 4%, is arranged marriage the right sacrifice of love? Come on, come on, tell the truth now. Raise your hand if you trust the elders in your family so much that you would let them pick your spouse for you. My parents are streaming with us right now from Maryland. I'm looking right at them, baby. No, <laughs> it ain't going down. I remember being invited or told that I was going to attend an arranged school dance for a young lady. I was told. I was going to attend. I go on the school dance with the young lady, and in conversation at the school dance, I find out she was my cousin. This is why you can't let folks arrange your marriage. Got me out here with my cousin. The reason I ask you all this question about arranged marriages, brothers and sisters, is because you should know that much of the love discussed in the Old Testament grows from arranged marriage relationships. The story that you have heard read in your hearing in the Bible, the story involving David and his first wife, Michal, this was an arranged marriage. Michal was the daughter of Saul. She was a woman who married David as a result of an arranged marriage, an arranged marriage where the bride price for their love was Saul asking David to provide him 100 dead Philistines. To read the story in Samuel, you would note there is no dating, there is no courtship, there is no love story, there is no posting on Instagram about the dates that they went on. There was no, you complete me and I love you. Yet the Bible says, without any of that courtship going on, in the 18th chapter of 1 Samuel, Michal loved David. Interestingly, 1 Samuel 18, where it tells us that Michal loved David, is the only time in all of Scripture where it is recorded that a woman loves a man. Here in the 18th chapter, it seems David and Saul are trying to coexist. They're trying to get along. I mean, Saul married off his daughter to David. But by the 19th chapter, Saul was back to his old tricks, and now he's ready to kill David again. Is this not the quintessential nature of family? I love you in one chapter. I'm ready to kill you in the next. Well, what a tough spot, Michal, David's wife and Saul's daughter was in. On the one hand, she has a husband whom she loves. And on the other hand, she's got her father whom I'm sure she loved. And her father was trying to murder her husband. Surely she would not be able to do both. You can't love your father who's trying to kill your husband and love your husband at the same time. Somewhere in the story, love was going to have to be sacrificed. What can this story teach us, brothers and sisters, this morning about the right sacrifice of love? What, what can you and I learn about how you and I have been called to sacrifice so that love may occur in our lives? And just because we see it in this story in a marital context, do not negate the fact that we are talking about not just the love of a spouse, but the love of a father. Whether you're talking about arranged marriage or free will marriage, either way, you're talking about sacrificing some love to make the team work. And at the right sacrifice of love, you should know, jot this down in your notes, that this entire story is centered on risk. To love, this text is going to teach us. If you're going to sacrifice anything in this Lenten season, if you are going to choose to love as God in Scripture is trying to teach us to love, then you and I have to sacrifice an unwillingness to risk. To love, the text is going to teach us. 
We must abandon playing it safe. We must abandon protecting ourselves. And we must be willing to throw caution to the wind and risk exposing ourselves to danger, risk exposing ourselves to getting hurt, risk exposing ourselves to the other person having our feelings and our heart on our hand because love is about risk. We've got to give up individual comfort for the sake of collective progress. And the right sacrifice of love in this season, if you dare to love your spouse, dare to love your child, dare to love your neighbor, dare to love anyone in your life, the right sacrifice of love you and I must learn in this Lenten season on our way to Easter is we must learn how to sacrifice an unwillingness to risk. Acclaimed poet and novelist Erica Jong says it like this, if you don't risk anything, you risk even more. This morning, Providence, will you take the risk? Will you take the risk that is the right sacrifice of love? I'm not just asking you to do it in your dating context. I'm not just asking you to do it in your marital context, but with your family members, with your coworkers, with your neighbors who will not take their trash cans back around to the back of their house. Will you be willing to risk? Mikhail, the wife of David in this text, she is in an arranged marriage, yet it was her willingness to risk that defines the right sacrifice of love in the text. Jumping into the story at the time of our text, Saul's anger is smoldering against David because Saul is jealous. He knows that God's hand is with David and God's hand has left him. Maybe it was jealousy that made him want to kill David. Maybe it was his hardened heart of evil that made him want to kill David. Maybe it was a sick and twisted ploy to win God's favor back that made him want to kill David. But no matter why he was doing it, independent of his motivation for his behavior, the Bible says he plotted consistently to murder David. In this chapter, David has just come back from war. He was fighting and defeating the Philistines to bring Saul the 100 dead bodies that were the required bride price, bride price for marrying Michal. When in verse 11, Saul sent messengers to David's house to keep watch over him because he was planning to kill him in the morning. David is in the house. Michal is in the house and Saul's goons are on the outside. And the Bible says, McCall sits down with her husband and she says to David, if you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. Translation, you might not know why Saul's got his goons on the outside, but I know my daddy better than you. You may not understand why there are soldiers in front of our house, but baby, they are not here to protect you. If you don't save your life tonight, Saul is going to kill you. This conversation seems like a loving wife talking to her husband. What you really ought to see in this conversation is a whole lot of risk. You have to remember that she's in an arranged marriage. McCall knows David may not yet trust her this early on in the marriage. McCall knows David may wonder where her fidelities lie. Does she love him or does she love her family? She has to know that David is wondering to himself, are you telling me the truth? Or are you trying to set me up for your dad? But, but through all of that uncertainty, she risks in her communication with David. She opens her mouth and has a clear and concise communication with her husband, even though it might cost her. How many of us in the name of love keep our voices quiet because we don't want to start anything? How many of us don't say what the Lord has put on our heart because we don't want to upset the other person? How many of us refuse to risk in conversation until we are confirmed and assured of how the other person is going to respond? Mikhail throws all that to the wind and says, I'm going to risk. She trusts that he'll trust her. And in one of the most difficult conversations a bride has ever had to have with her groom, she tells David, if you don't leave here tonight, you will be killed in the morning. 
Her love of David makes her willing to risk. Her love compels her to throw caution to the wind. Her love allows her to expose herself to the potential dangers that come when speaking to your husband this type of way. And the question becomes, would you risk it? Would you risk your standing and your position with the man of God that God has touched just to save his life? Would you risk going against your father's wishes and having your family be upset with you just because God has laid it on your heart? Would you risk having your husband get upset with you and not trust you for telling him the truth just because God has laid it on their heart? Would you risk? Verse 12 said, she lowers David out of a window. David responds positively to the information that he's being received. He's willing to run away. He has an army just like Saul does. He could fight Saul just like any other person could be fighting if you were brought into such a situation. But David said, the scripture reminded me to touch not mine anointed and to do my prophet no harm. I'm not going to fight Saul, so he runs. She lowers him out of a window. She grabs an idol, something like a doll or a statue. She puts it on the pillow. She goes and grabs some goat hair, goat hair that their clothing was made out of, and she lays it on the head of the idol, and she covers it with clothes. She's already risked in her communication with David, and when the sun comes up, she knows she's going to have to risk again when the soldiers come to her door. The Bible says in verse 14 that Saul in the morning sends his soldiers to take David away to kill him. And as a woman in a patriarchal society who has just been sold into marriage by her father for 100 dead Philistines, this woman has the courage of faith and the conviction to risk again. She reasoned to herself, I know that in this society women are not allowed to lie to men. I know the danger that is before me in lying to these soldiers. I know how my father is going to respond when he finds out that I protected David and didn't listen to him. But my love for David compels me to risk. Do you feel in love the compulsion to risk? When you think about the love that you have for your spouse, the love that you have for your children, the love that you have for your family members, the love that you have for your co-workers, the love that you have for all of God's creation, do you feel compelled to risk? Love, the right sacrifice of love, is about not playing it safe. The right sacrifice of love is about allowing God to use you to bless other people. The right sacrifice of love is to allow you to let other people be secured by the fact that you are going to throw yourself out there for them. You are going to expose yourself to danger for them. You are going to let God use you for them. He is sick. She risks. He is sick, she declares. With soldiers at her door, she proclaims he is sick. In that moment when she tells the soldiers that he is sick, she has not just lied to the soldiers. She has effectively lied to the king. She's lied to her father. She is risking it all. You and I wouldn't have any issue lying to the president of the United States because we know the president couldn't just kill us for lying. But in her day, to lie to the king was an egregious offense guilty and punishable by death. She's risking for the man that she loves. Brothers and sisters, I've come this morning to tell you that this is how you and I are being taught the right sacrifice of love. This is how you and I are being taught to engage with people in our lives who we love. We have to be willing to risk. They go back to Saul and they tell him, David is sick. We couldn't bring him. Translation, his wife stood in the door. Your daughter, she wouldn't get out the way. Just him being sick is not going to make the soldiers turn around. But you and I both know in the story, she wouldn't let the soldiers in. And the soldiers knew better than to manhandle the king's daughter. So they go back to the king and they say, listen, we couldn't, we couldn't get David. He's sick. He's sick. He's in the bed. Your daughter stood in the way and saw the Bible says, if you look close, says, I don't care if he's sick. Go back to his house and bring the whole bed with him in it. This joker has to die, not now, but right now. Go back to my house, and if my daughter gets in the way, don't hurt her, but move her out of the way. The soldiers go back to the door. You can imagine how hard they banged on the door. Mikhail, 
Your dad says we got to take David out. Mikhail knows the joke's on them. She probably gets out the way this time. Soldiers go on in. They go on upstairs. David, it's time for you to get up. They pull the sheep back. Only to find they're looking at a statue with goat's hair on it. Somebody probably picked the goat's hair up like a weave and just pulled it off. So what is this? What is this? What is this? Who is going to go back to Saul and tell him all we have is weave in our hands? What am I supposed to do with this? They go back to Saul. They tell him the truth. Imagine Saul's surprise. Imagine the incredulous look of bewilderment on Saul's face. My only daughter has lied to me. She has risked it all. She has lied to me in front of these soldiers. And she did it all for my number one enemy. The Bible doesn't tell you that Saul goes all the way down to the house. You just find in the next verse that he's having a conversation with McCall. Either McCall has been brought up to the king's or the king has come all the way down to his house. When I read the story, in my mind, I see Saul put his shoes on. I don't know who this girl thinks she is. Stomps all the way out of the castle, goes all the way down to David's house, and he's speaking directly to his daughter like a disappointed father. Why have you deceived me like this and let my enemy go. You and I read the text, you expect her to say, because he's my husband, because I, I love him, B because God told me to. But a close reading of the text, she doesn't offer any of those as reasons. She lies again. She says to her father, Saul, she says, David said to me, let me go. Why should I kill you? David didn't threaten her. David didn't raise his hands toward her. But Mikhail knows if I'm going to make it out of this situation, if, if I'm going to get out of this situation alive, if, I, if I'm not going to have Saul get upset with me and put me on that cross like they did Jesus, then I need to keep Saul's anger where it should be directed. Daddy, it's not my fault. I didn't want to let him go. Daddy, I asked him to stay right here. But David rose up. He saw those soldiers out of there. And he said to me, you need to let me go. Because if you don't, I'm going to kill you. Daddy, I was so scared. I was so worried. Daddy, I was so nervous. I thought David was going to come and get me. I thought David was going to take me. Daddy, I'm always following you. You're the king. Of course, I'm supporting you. David does scared me. She lies again to her father. David said he'd kill me, daddy. Imagine now at this point in time, some man has the audacity to threaten your daughter. Saul is upset. She has risked in communication with David. She has risked in communication with the soldiers, and she's risked a third time in her communication with Saul. Prophet, and she did it all in the name of love. The right sacrifice of love is to sacrifice our aversion to risk. You and I read this story in the 19th chapter of 1 Samuel, and we are reminded that we have been called to sacrifice the comfortable in favor of the uncomfortable. Here it is. If when I am sacrificing my unwillingness to risk, what I'm really doing is controlling situations to keep them under my thumb so that I can be comfortable at all times. That translated spiritually means I don't trust God enough to make it all right, so I have to make it all right. God is not good enough to keep me safe, so I've got to keep myself safe. The Lord isn't going to make sure my relationship works. I am going to make sure my relationship works. I will not wake up in the morning and lean on the everlasting arms because my arms work just fine. McCall says, I can risk because somebody's got me. And interestingly in the text, when McCall is both to me a woman of power and a woman of faith, because of her willingness to risk, you and I should be remembered that if we are going to love, we have to be willing to risk as well. This is why, brothers and sisters, Corinthians teaches us by the Apostle Paul that love is for grown-ups. 
Only a grown-up is going to be mature enough to trust that God is going to take care of it. Only a grown-up is going to be mature enough to trust that the love between us is so strong, I can say something risky and God is going to keep us. Only a grown-up is going to be so mature that they are going to trust that God will make everything all right. Thomas Jefferson, who otherwise is not worthy of being quoted, once famously said, with great risk comes great reward. Because of her willingness to risk, David does escape Saul. And the great reward is that she and David are able to be reunited. Eventually, Saul is deposed as king. Eventually, King David does become king, and their love has a chance to thrive. If you keep reading in Samuel going on to 2 Samuel, you know the story doesn't end well. Their love doesn't last that long, but that's not important to this particular sermon. Let's focus on the fact that the love lasted through the 21st chapter and leave it at that. But when you think about taking a risk for the people who are sitting on your pew right now, when you think about taking a risk for your own mother or your father, when you think about taking a risk for your own children, realize that you would not be the first person in the history of the world to risk for someone that you loved. Was there not a man who risked leaving heaven and coming all the way to earth to save your soul and mine? Was there not a man who risked being the first to introduce a new religion to a band of culturally conscious Jews? Was there not a man who took a risk to do three years of ministry with some men who would betray him, some other men who would deny him, and another man who would doubt him? Was it not a risk to get up on a cross and die like a criminal on behalf of other people? But was not all that risk worth the reward? Was not all that reward that comes when you see that you and I are alive today was not all that reward comes when you see that you and I are going to make it to heaven one day was not all that reward worth the risk when the blood of Jesus Christ reconciles all of humanity back into relationship with God risk today brothers and sisters as you continue to fast on your 46 day march to Easter Ask yourself, am I loving the people in my life at the level that God has called me to love them? Am I loving them enough to move our relationship into the place where I will trust God more than I trust myself? Where I will risk, expose myself to danger and be vulnerable because the people in your life are so special that they are worth great risk so that you can receive great reward. God bless your providence.